to the Independent Investor Channel. It's been uh, a long time coming reporting out here on Hylion. And, um, you know, I feel like uh, as the stock has gone down, the sentiment has gone down. The, the the sweet irony in that whole thing is that the company itself has been on an upward trajectory marked for the last three years. So we're faced with a little bit of an impasse here on, on what we do. Um, we're probably sitting at probably the lowest uh, sentiment that we've probably ever had uh, when looking at the opportunity here with Hylion. And I find that to be very counterintuitive because the very opportunity that we should be looking at here priced at you know 230 a, a share um, should be contrasted against what we uh, just incurred within three years and with a new company the range of stock can vary widely and you have to go back and look at the euphoria surrounding the stock at 58 dollars a share and ask yourself, is the company in a better position now, uh, or are we in a better position now? And you can answer that in a lot of different ways, but I tell you what, there's a real shift in sentiment that I that I feel. Certainly some uh, pockets of, of timing during the 2022. 2022 was a really, really bad year for, for this company, uh, the stock. Um, the progress of the company has actually lent itself to building up to something extremely material. Now, th there's a couple of things here that I just want to point out. And a lot of stock market, a lot of stock investing um, is predicated upon the information that's publicly disclosed, as well as communicated through the company's vision in the quarterly addresses given by the CEO. And I, I tell you what, <clears throat> I listen uh, intently. Um, I've reviewed the Q4 call twice. In all fairness, um, I was enthralled. Every single word that went into the delivery, um, everything that was spoken about uh, on the call gave me no indication whatsoever that this thing isn't for real. For real. What we lack at this current juncture is real credibility, real merit, something real tangible to sink our teeth into because we're on the onset, some of those original orders that have come, come through and find themselves on the order bit queue currently, uh, we've been a little bit in, in a dry spell of that. Uh, and, and I think that in all fairness to the company, their strategic priorities by nature of the admission from the CEO, Thomas Ely, has been on ensuring that those first 200 orders are going to be spotless rollouts available to those first 200 um, with a, a, a continue to monitor through the uh, white glove program, okay? Now, I, I want you to kind of think about, I know everybody out there has their own idea about, you know, how to integrate the class eight space and um, how they should be selling millions of units. And I know Thomas Healy has probably made some pointed uh, criticisms toward the investor community in suggesting that, you know, there there needs some be needs to be some patience deployed, and what we probably understand about augmenting the class eight space and how difficult it is um, is probably in order to point out. In other words, the way Hylion has went about stepping into this um, this augmentation of the class eight fleet has been, in my best assessment, to be a scaled in approach, right? Uh, garnering orders in the 10 to 20 category. There's been a few orders that have hit the books that have certainly got attention, but I think the further removed you get from 10 and 25, even some of the bigger orders like 50 and 100, kind of speak to the long-term commitment and and kind of degrades a little bit from the, from the merits of the order. Um, in other words, to suggest, yeah, sure, when I look at those orders, but you know, an order that's placed on the books of 10 by a large uh, fleet 
It's realistic. Uh, it's believable. Um, it's fillable <laughs> at this point, and it probably carries with it the most amount of merit in the face of a company right now that still, as of today, has not achieved CARB, NHTSA, EPA certification. I believe that certification to be looming, and I believe it to be inevitable, and I believe in short order we will have that announcement and we'll be able to put that major milestone in the company's history behind us. I think there is a lot at play here. I think as an astute investor, you have to be able to look at the totality of the situation when making your evaluation on the company. At the same time, you could just simplify your life and not invest at all. Because at the end of the day, we have a company, an investor, and we have a decision to buy or not to buy. It's worth really repeating that watered down version of what gets misconstrued all the time when emotional content gets added to the equation, when people who may have been completely over levered to the position are feeling the impacts of maybe holding a stock that um, by everybody's admission, or at least the feeling that we get with regard to the sentiment surrounding the stock will never go up. And so the stock market is a very humbling place. This has been one of those examples of absolute horrendous stock action. At the end of the day, I come back to company investor and a decision to buy or not to buy. Now, there's certain complexities that go into that very rudimentary explanation of, of stock market investing and um, the very deep uh, explanation as to how much, um, how much risk tolerance is going to be necessary, how much due diligence did you do on the company, how much do you understand about the market that this company is, uh, is uh, going after and, and trying to penetrate, um, and much, much more. I would say that there's probably going to be people who will hold this through uh, that um, hold a certain batch of attributes that the unastute investor might look at and say, how in the hell did you do that? How did you trip and fall into the stock at $2 a share and, and hold the stock long term to uh, a point in the future north of your uh, inject point? Uh, Sell at two dollars. It's a hundred percent. Excuse me. Sell at four dollars. A hundred percent profit. Sell at eight dollars. Sell at sixteen twenty five. Watch the stock go up. Right. And there's going to be really a ton of good investors that got involved in this based on the same criteria that will lose, and they will lose big time. I would suggest with what this highly on uh, opportunity has presented thus far. The vast majority of the share owner base at this point is sitting on losses, right? So the evaluation over the highly on opportunity from a stock perspective now is extremely negative, extremely negative with regard to where we've been. And I think it draws a distinction between codifying where we've been and Looking at the future potential now, sitting at a $2.30 stock price, we come back to the admissions by Thomas Healy on the last quarterly call about the continued interest in the product, uh, the continued uh, foot stomping of the um, eligibility of Hylion uh, to qualify for the multiple incentives through the mandates that are coming down the pike. Guys, these are coming. These are common. Investor, company, to do, not to do, right? These are some of the things that play into that. Now, with these looming positive catalysts on the on the horizon, not to suggest that Hylion will take part in any of it, but they are inevitable. And the question becomes, 
how is it that Hylion could potentially penetrate those specific elements when we look at doing our fundamentals and we're looking at doing our analysis and building an investment thesis on the company? How is it that Hylion could stand to benefit from that? What are some of the things that are going to go into a successful Hylion as opposed to one that just rides off into the neon green sunset and and never to exist again and um, leaves um, a a legacy of investor carcasses behind its wake. It's fun to speculate. It's fun to revolve around the topic right now. It's fun to make analogies of um, how bad it's been. I'm not looking to sugarcoat anything. I'm going to tell you it's been horrible. On a scale of zero to 10 on stock performance, Hylion gets a zero. They get a zero. They get no credit for stock performance. Um, what and how Thomas Healy is awarded uh, free shares for performance is beyond me. Um, I, I don't... I don't understand what performance criteria uh, outside of the roadmap to commercialization that's been laid out for the last five or six quarters. I get that. Um, but I kind of chalk that up as being, look, you know, in Q1 of 2022, we're going to put one foot in front of the other, and then we're going to check that box off of there. And in other words, all of it is for not if the goals and focus and vision and checking off as many check boxes as you potentially can want to check off and set realistic expectations. All of it is for not if you can't drive revenue. If you cannot drive revenue with the company, then all of this is futile. Okay. And if you're that investor analyzing the company chooses not to invest based on the thesis that nothing is going to materialize going forward, then you will have chosen correctly. Now, until Hylion goes out of business and completely goes tits up and goes bankrupt, which right now it would be irresponsible to make that type of assessment over a company that's got some massive, massive piles of cash. And I tell you what, they've got that cash earmark for burn. No doubt about that. Uh, John Panzer talked about a $200 million burn uh, for this year. $200 million, just shy of, puts him at about a half a cash burn. Um, I, I know uh, Shovashenko from the Discord group has kind of talked about a cash burn rate of about three years. I agree with that. I think that's a, I think that's a fair timeline which is significantly more than what they need. Now I'll take the insurance. I, I really will. I'll take the ca cash insurance. I, I mean, if we were looking at a cash burn rate that would put them later on to this year, I would think that there's too big of a gap there to cover. Um, I would rather see some overlap uh, between the company actually generating some top end uh, revenue to augment the cost of doing business, which I would remind our viewing audience is relatively low. Okay, with the ability to sustain that legacy funding uh, through a break-even period or a, a period of overlap where we can say, "Hey, listen, we're we're generating twenty-five million top-end revenue. We're generating fifty million in top-end revenue." You start to get to the hundred million mark, and I would suggest that the company could start to incur debt financing at that point when we've got a realistic path toward toward revenue. And I'm not even talking about profit at this point. I think the company needs to churn out close to a billion dollars of revenue um, to start to really enjoy that margin expansion piece that we're all excited about. And the margin expansion piece doesn't come until they integrate with the OEM. So I digress. I give you guys a piece of how my mind works in evaluating this very, very complex story. I've seen people try to cover highly on and they should probably just stick to yelling and screaming into the microphone and showing off their banana tits because this, this isn't for the faint of heart. Um, this isn't for an elementary passive investor who just chooses to buy VT with their life and sleep on their investments until they're 67 years old. 
it's just not. You can evaluate the company now and, and suggest that the balance sheet, the income statements, and the cash flows are dirty right now. Um, that's a given. Um, I, I can tell you what, in my 30, 25 to 30 years of experience in investing, there's certain companies that don't even need their their uh, financial statements evaluated to know that to buy the company. And this is one of them. Um, if you're going to look at the financial statements and try to determine a, a fundamental path to giving you a yes or a no to whether or not you want to buy this company, you're not going to be educated enough to make that uh, decision enough outside of it just being an educated guest based on your isolated metric looking at the financials. Um, and so to succeed on this project, there has to be some material progress made on the OEM line. And I just want to take this opportunity. I catch every one of Excalibur's videos and I, I don't comment on all of them. I try to support as much as I can. Uh, but I just want to give a, a quick shout out. <clears throat> I really appreciate the level-headed, calm, and unique. And I, I tell you what, you put my perspective out there, you put some of the other perspectives out there, Excalibur being one of those, and we can really start to formulate, not to mention, you know, BlackRock holding the amount of shares that they do, not willy-nilly, not because they're just wagging it out there thinking that somehow Hylion has a chance of making it, rather that they've got a pretty darn good chance of actually being there for a first look, uh, turning something material out there. But those formulated opinions out there in the marketplace, if they provide no value to people, as if we could go back 15 years ago, before the time of YouTube and before the time of coming on and offering unique perspectives. Now, you would know if I was jaded and came on and, you know, tried to light my hair on fire, neon green and, you know, yell and scream and then throw a fit and, 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 you know, shock factor deliverance to people that I was a fake ass bastard. I think you can tell that I'm not one of those. Um, my thesis of the company has only grown stronger since I've been monitoring the company for three short years. And I want to, I just wanted to shot shot those guys out. He's given me a couple shot outs in the video, and I want to return the favor. In all fairness, um, Excalibur's been on the live stream with me, and certainly an open door policy on the Independent Investor Channel anytime. Um, I think it's going to be a lot funner of a project to actually cover once we get a little bit of uh, material clearance here, because I think it would take a nuclear option uh, to change the sentiment in any one given name, not just Hylian, but right now the investor sentiment across the entire stock market is horrible. I mean, we've got this idea that somehow a bank failing in California is going to somehow bring down the entire financial institutions. When might I remind you just 13 short years ago, we had the mortgage-backed security crisis, and um, that, my friends, was a systemic event. I don't know if I would go so far as to uh, suggest that um, because this company was over-levered in risky tech startups, that somehow that needs to be rewarded in way of a bailout. And Janet Yellen has just announced today that a bailout will not happen. Um, uh, investment insurance up to the cap of 250000 which everybody knows to protect depositors will be honored. And anything after that is just a wait and see. Um, I don't have any sympathy, none. Um, I'm a small fry that's looking to get my first portfolio up to 250000 and it'll probably be a life's effort to try to do that. Okay. But I digress and I come back to some of the interesting rhetoric that's going on right now with regard to the Hylian evolution and the Hylian story. And everybody's coming on and talking about that they know exactly the current disposition of the company at present and 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 this is what's going to happen and yada, yada, and blah, blah, and blah, 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 blah. If you go back and draw a distinction between the company's first SHLL uh, ticker symbol, the run up to $58. 
it doesn't get any more euphoric than that. Any more euphoric than that, okay? And I'll draw a simple analogy for you guys. Once that euphoria stops, right, and you're, you're completed with your euphoria, how do you feel afterwards, right? You kind of feel confused. You kind of feel a little bit dizzy, right? You kind of feel like, I don't know, maybe you just don't know what to do with yourself. And I don't know, you're kind of confused about where you are and, and what you're doing and, and um, you know, making sure all of your dogs are still barking and all that stuff. I would suggest that that post euphoric phase is probably what we're in right now. And we've been there for quite a long time. Now, there was no overlap, I don't believe. I mean, there was probably people who started shorting the stock at around $58. And those were the the few out there that, that got it right. Most of the people out there were very, very excited about the stock in the 40s and 50s. Um, I was not one of them. Um, I've never bought the stock over $20, $20 never. Um, my buying started south of 20 uh, and it's picked up accelerated at the $10 mark and even more at the $5 mark and just here as of late with the two handle in front of it. That's just me. Um, to each his own. Uh, I could be wrong. I could be right. I'd love to see a dollar of insurance. Um, you know, I'd like to see a couple dollars of appreciation to prove to myself that stocks do 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 something other than just go down because the last three years of um, investment um, uh, involvement has been horrible. The stock market's really, really been on tilt. But when this is all said and done, is the timeline going to play out like this? And I want you guys to listen up to this because I'm going to give you some insight to dig as deep as I can on my philosophy about stock market investing, because I tell you what, there's a lot of know-it-alls out there. Stock market has no place for know-it-alls, none. Um, you into a, into a position as 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 an option holder to either buy or 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 not buy the company. Okay, those are the four aspects of of the company. But when this is all said and done, is it going to be that story that just had a timeline from initial rollout to public markets to the euphoric top at 58, all the way down to an inevitable going out of business timeline in three short years? Okay, those would be the two timelines for me, the up and the down. That's it. Uh, the pre-surge. And the post uh, the post surge phase of the company, which has lasted, you know, two two and a half years as of now, shot up quickly. A lot of excitement around the name, which is indicative of the power of the stock market during more conducive times, more con more euphoric and more, to be honest with you, FOMO uh, buying times. Now everything has probably swung deep. Uh, to the deep requirement of having uh, companies really prove out their fundamentals with the re-ratings that are going on in the stock market with uh, higher interest rates, lending costs more expensive, et cetera, which was the demise of, of SVB. But I draw your attention to the 58 extreme and the $2 extreme, okay? Those are the two extremes. Now, if the presumption from now until an undetermined time into the future is that based on our time, our cost continuum from 58 to 2 actually goes from 2 to 0 from here over the next two and a half years, that could be your thesis. Absolutely. It could be. Based on everything that we know, about the stock really having nowhere to go except for a downward trajectory. To continue that downward trajectory would be in line with uh, the current channeling of the stock from a technical perspective to, to see it continue to go down. 
Now, if you look at a longer term chart, it would suggest that a leveling, leveling off ha has been occurring for many, many months in the company. And we are in this $2 to $4 trading range, two to four, two to four, right? We were just at 380 a couple of months ago, um, only to come back off of those levels hard. Um, I'm not sure if it was based on some of the released information during the last call. I would just suggest that there really hasn't been anything earth shattering with the company to justify any moves north of where its current level sits. I, I'm trying to be fair. Uh, if I was going to say that they're partnering with a major institution like a Cummins, that could, that could be that catalyst that can move the company. Maybe it's being overtaken and maybe it shoots up three or four dollars a share, right? Um, in expectation of maybe realizing all that value below the surface we know is there, but it cannot realize that value right now, trading at two dollars and thirty cents. My friends, the stock has been discredited, it has been discarded, and it is in a prove it moment. Hylion will have to start generating some catalysts to actually have this story materialize lies over time. And I believe we are set up for some major catalysts. We'll come back to Excalibur's point about um, defining the, um, the OEM line. He mentioned something that I didn't catch in either one of them. I heard what I believe is the same um, context around, um, around the OEM line and having the line specced for the Hylion product, I, I heard that interp a little bit different. Um, <clears throat> we could both be wrong. We could both be right. Um, uh, I could be wrong. He could be right. It doesn't really matter. But I was fascinated by his explanation as to how he took that as a, a, a very bullish type of approach. And I was uh, conversely interested how he was able to interpret um, the interest from fleets and not placing orders now as being a little more negative than I took it. I, I took it actually the opposite. I took it as if, if I'm out there and I'm trying to sell the Hylion unit and I'm a company, I want to see that approved. I want to see the, the carbon NHTSA certification achieved. I want to see that. Furthermore, there's justification for me not jumping on the bandwagon initially You've heard that old onus. We don't. We want to make sure that we're not buying new technology because usually that's the where most of the kinks are being worked out when that new technology rolls out. We see it all the time with passenger vehicles, right? When those are turned out into the marketplace, and those problems are incurred on the onset with those additional models. Okay, and once they get that kind of dialed in, you can see that some of the subsequent models usually are turned out with some incredible reliability, except if you're a Toyota. Toyota's always been awesome. Matter of fact, some of those older renderings of some of the Toyota models, you get the most life out of them. But I think there's merit. And when I heard it, I, I related with that idea that if I'm highly on and I'm having to sell my product this early in the game, which by Thomas Healy's admission has not been their primary focus. Um, and I tell you what, it better shift at some point to be that. Uh, and they will determine when that time is. But I, I, just, I just resonate with this idea of it being too early in the game and that companies are providing feedback to Hylion to say, look, we're, we're very interested in your product. We have to wait until that subsequent certification comes. We cannot speculate from a large company perspective on new technology, even though we know how good it is even though you're sharing your interest from an industry perspective from some of these other large fleets who have made decisions to get in the front of the line, which could end up being a good strategic decision, it could end up backfiring. Who's to know that something major isn't missed or, or Hylion doesn't earn certification? You want to know what happens to those orders if this gets blown out of the water, right? I don't foresee that happening, my friends. But to make a business decision that hinges upon tens of millions of dollars, and in some cases, hundreds of millions of dollars, potentially, for these orders to be placed on the books prematurely, doesn't benefit the companies at all, except for a, a, a perceived place in line 
type of advantage maybe in getting the OEM slots solidified earlier than later. I, I don't know if you guys determine any other strategic advantage to that. I'd like to hear that, but it seems realistic to me that if they're going out and they're pitching the Hylion solution, that they are failing to close a lot of these sales meetings, or if they're even going into them with sales meetings, I would go into them as an introduction. I wouldn't be trying to sell a thing right now. No way. It's not worth it. And if this is in line with the way Thomas Healy thinks and focusing in on making sure that those 200, which in my mind is a step up from the 10 to a nice strategic rollout of a nice round number of 200, it's a step up 10 to 200. Where do they go from there? The Bears would say that they're going from 200 to zero. I would suggest that they'll go from 200 to 500, right? If this whole Highland story is looking to evolve the way that we think that it could evolve over time, then it's safe to presume that, you know, them garnering 500 orders uh, per year, maybe 150, 125 orders per quarter, is not outside the realm of possibility. As long as they have that that spec buy-in from the OEM line. Now, mind you guys, they're only looking to go after one OEM right now. And every indication is that their OEM relationship with Peterbilt is, is solid. You know, in business, anything can happen. There's a lot of nuclear options that could happen with Hylion that could blow this thing out of the water. And until that happens, guys, and if it ever does happen... I will come on and I will profess to you that we, me, all of us were wrong as a community because the relationship with Peter Peterbilt was not as strong as, as declared by the CEO, right? If, you know, there's a, a critical flaw in the design and durability of the unit that just, they can't get more than two and a half years out of the unit, that's a nuclear problem, Okay. If the mileage ends up being an anemic 575 and not the thousand that was promised as far as long-term, long-haul, over-the-road application, that could be a nuclear problem, and it could definitely blow out blow out the water. All credibility that we've looked to build up over time with Hylion, I think that would be very, very unfortunate. Lots of other foreseen things that could happen. Uh, supply chain relationships with Cummins could fall out. Uh, supply chain relationships with previously Meritor and IE Cummins now could fall through the cracks. You know, my biggest nuclear option would be their fallout with Peterbilt. Guys, I just don't see any indication at all, and I look, that that happens. Um, the OEMs have got to have a place to go and they have to have a strategic partner. And dare I might presume, and I'm going to start on my, my presumptuous piece here. Okay. Here's my theory. Okay. I'm going to go on a completely theory, uh, 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 theoretical thread right now. I believe Peterbilt. I believe Hylion. I believe Hyzon. I believe Cummins, I believe General Electric, I believe every single one of those entities that are involved right now in Hylion knew exactly where these mandates were going many, many years ago. And it was then that the alliances started to forge, as opposed to this being some sort of willy-nilly, hey, we're courting each other. And if you're not good in the bed, I get to break up with you, okay? Or if you decide, if I decide that you're not quite as good a looking as I thought you were on the initial when we started dating, um, that there's a non-exclusivity type of clause here. Or you turned out to be um, somebody that I just uh, didn't expect that you would turn out to be and that we're just going to make a clean break here. I think that those vettings have been going on for a long, long time. And I think we are now where we are based on that pre, pre that pre-established relationship between Hylion and the OEMs. I absolutely believe that in my heart of hearts. And so the question becomes, 
the timeline that I discussed from two to zero. Right now we sit at two thirty, and there is no indication at all, my friends. I I get the scuttlebutt in the Discord group. I monitor it. A lot of the times I do not comment. Okay. But there's cats in there saying it's going to go to dollar eighty eight, no lower. What is the difference between a dollar eighty eight and two oh eight in the grand scheme of things with the ranges that I'm talking about? The only thing that I care about avoiding is avoiding the two dollar to zero mark. That's it. And I'm quite certain that BlackRock would probably like to avoid that as well. Some of the other major large shareholder institution, hell, Thomas Healy alone would probably not like to see the stock go to 50 cents a share, right? Um, man owns a ton of shares. So I, I think in no help from Hylion whatsoever, the stock has held in fairly nicely at this range, and it's done so for quite some time. Now, you might say, Ryan, you know, if it breaks, you know, levels, the all-time low of 206, 208, whatever it was, we're in for real trouble. Yeah, I don't, I don't really know. I think from zero to four dollars, I think we're in this anemic range. I think it's justified wherever it falls in that range, and and I'm good waiting it out. And and the very catalysts that we see on the horizon have have got to materialize for us to move out of that range. So if it's at fifty cents or three dollars and seventy five cents, what really is the difference when we look at? the story in its context. And I look at four to zero as being extremely oversold category and very undervalued based on that progression, that impact of the company slightly going up and to the right over the last three years and the stock price slowly degrading in value over the last three years as it approaches this critical mass where it is now. And I would think just as it was overbought at 58. I think it's oversold here. All is fair in love and war. You have to truly look at the opportunity. And the, what I said at the top of this week's delivery is that there will be people that trip and fall into this name and they make a fortune. They make a fortune. And if you do not have the uh, below the surface application enough like I do to understand that the big money in this company is probably going to be made 10 years from now. now if you've stayed with me for 37, 38 minutes in, in this weekly address, I'll just tell you, somebody who buys the stock here at 230 and sells for 250 will make a profit, okay? They will prove, in fact, that you can make money on highly on holdings and any other stock in the stock market for that matter. Anybody who buys the company at $2.30 here and sells for $5, they're going to double their money. They're going to double their money. They get rich. Phenomenal investors. We will probably have all kinds of bandwagon investors come out of the drugs. I'm watching a few. They'll probably come out of the drugs and say, I've been here the whole time, Ryan. I've just decided to... Take it off, take the year off for the last two years, the last three years, while it was really hard to do so. But I, I've been here in spirit. I've been here the whole time. Mm -hmm. You will have doubled your money for the people that buy at 230 and they deploy patience and they go past that 250 mark and they go past that $5 mark and they make it back to that SPAC IPO of $10. By God, it took a swoon. For many, many years, and nary did I ever think that we'll ever see this $2 amount again, and we're here. Lord have mercy. Hit that sell button. Hit that, 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 that sell button, that sell button. The material progress that the company will show from now until we hit each of those milestones, let's just make it easy to the IPO price of $10 a share. The milestones that the company will have demonstrated to get back to that will absolutely be the very seeds that will carry it to 25, 50, and 100. There will be rogues of investors that sell out of this company early. 
they will have made money 100%. Just like right now, we can earmark the vast majority of shareholders in the company are 100% in the negative. 100%. But my friends, I want to remind you that making your observations in the acute, albeit fun, albeit makes for great weekly content, speaks nothing to the amount of devotion and dedication that you're going to need on this to realize the maximum profit. And I fear that the retail community, as they've failed on the way down, will also um, be quick to disappoint me, as they usually are, in their ability to lose on this company on the way up. And I think that premature selling is going to be the absolute, uh, uh, that is going to be the downfall of this very company is that it has driven all sentiment out of the stock at this point. It has pulverized any type of rational interpretation of what is possible in stock market investing specific to one specific equity, and that is highly on holdings, in that we were on top of the world, $58 a share. Now we're in the doldrums of hell. And there's never any other way out of hell. And when somebody finally sees that little crack of light, like stepping out of the uh, upside down world, you know, a little stranger things, they step out of the outside, upside down world and they finally find their way out and they find that sell button. They looked for it. They looked for it for two and a half years because they were like, I'm over this. I'm out. I'm out. I'm out. I'm out. I'm out. I'm out. You're going to have a mass exodus of retail investors that are going to continue to parlay their shares to the large institutions, which understand exactly what I understand, in that you cannot go back in time and repurchase shares. You cannot go back to March 12th, 2023, and have the ability to purchase shares at $2.30 once the stock price is at $10 a share. Okay. The same explanation goes for when the company is trading at $2.37 and $38.40 and $43, which is my price target for the company. And people think I'm crazy. And I dare you suggest to remind people that just three short years ago, it had ran up through that mark under false pretenses. And I think this time around, is going to be based on a whole lot more fundamental and a whole lot more about what we know about the potential is of this company. And if we fail to recognize this, there's going to be a lot of profit left on the table. And I'll do my very best to marshal and shepherd you through the entire process, guys. I really appreciate you tuning in for this week's Highly on Update and uh, continue to uh, foot stomp this message. Um, I will be off the grid for the next two weeks. Um, no more highly on for the next two weeks. I will be on a work commitment. I will be out of area and out of pocket. This will be the last address that we have for a couple of weeks. When we come back, we'll pick up the pieces and we'll continue to really look toward closing down the ice age, this uh, bridging period that I feel like the company has been in for the vast past many, many months that we've incurred together. Nothing's changed. Nothing's changed. The stock price is probably close to what it was a few months back. And um, whether or not we improve upon those or whether or not a few months from now we're looking at the same stock price or lower or higher really doesn't speak to you asking the scary question. And that is, what do you really want out of this company? Do you want the total overall profit potential? If you do, and you've entered into the company long-term and you truly understand what the definition of long-term investing is, then what are you so worried about? What are you so interested that the stock goes to $1.88 and no lower? That the stock may end up seeing a, a, a 50 cent you know, price tag on it. What are you so worried about that for? If you're truly long-term and you understand that your opportunity 
could potentially be inevitable into the future and stop worrying so much. We'll pick up the pieces when it is appropriate to do so. Guys, I appreciate it. If you uh, enjoy the content, subscribe to the channel, man, hit the notification bell. Always help generate some churn in the conversation piece. In this video, I appreciate all your support and continually providing this very important time in the company's evolution. We will continue to do the good work. Guys, thank you so much for tuning into the message and good luck in your investment future.